we have Docker here. Um, and so to run uh, to run a container, uh, we have to pull an image. So let's do that. You can do that with Docker pull, and then we need to supply what is, what is what's called a an image identifier. So a string that identifies an image. And I'm going to use and I'm going to use Debian, the Linux distribution based on open source software. I just do that. Oh, sorry. I had to restart the Docker daemon because I restarted my computer. Okay, there it is. And here we are. It was very quick because uh, I already had the image installed. Uh, but if, if we want to check that what, what images are available on a system and if what we, uh, what we got with a pull command, we do it with the docker images command. And here is a list of the images that I have on my, on my system. And here it is the Debian image. So we have an image ID. And also we have an indication of when the image was created. Uh, notice that this is corresponds to the original time when the image was created and non and not when I downloaded it uh, on uh, on uh, on my current system so how do we run a container from here well it's, the command is docker run then we have to supply the image identifier and then arguments that will be executed within the container so for example i will use the cat program to print information related to the operating system and here you see we get the debian debian linux version 11 balsai okay so pretty much what what we expected um, but how can we be sure that this actually <clears throat> this actually uh, ran into a container? Well, uh, if I run the same command natively, you can see that the laptop I'm running on in reality is a CentOS 8 Linux. So a, distri a distribution that is rather different from from Debian. So we can see that the, the this command actually ran on a very different context so this is the form with which we can run arbitrary commands within containers um, but sometimes um, it is very useful to have an interactive session within a container for example and especially when things are not working like we would expect them to um, so an interactive session is useful to get into the container, see what's uh, trying to understand what is happening, then and then hopefully fixing it. So how can you can, how can we do that? Do it with Docker run, and then we use the IT option. There are two options here. I is for interactive. T is for opening a TTY. Then we use the image identifier and then we, we choose to run bash okay I am inside the container and the first thing to note is that I am I am not my user anymore but I have become root and this is pretty much the it's pretty much the 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 default in Docker if uh, additional users were not defined in uh, in the image or in the Docker file. So here I am at the at the file system root. Here, the, these are the contents, the file system of my container coming from the image, and I can pretty much do all the things that that I would be able to do in a regular shell. And once I've done, once I have finished working, 
uh, here, I can just use the exit command or hit Control D, and I return to my um, to my to the native environment and getting out of the container. So um, so far, we have only ran uh, Debian 11, but what if I want a different version of Debian? What if I want a, a, a previous one? So we need a different version of this of this image. So um, in Docker, different versions of the same image are handled with uh, tags. Tags are suffixes that um, that are entered after the image name and using a colon as the separator. So, for example. Um, I'm going to use stretch, which was a previous version of Debian. Now we'll use the pull command. This time we see the, the layer is actually downloading. And I have the... Um, and now I have this new flavor of of Debian, here it is. So if I run this, uh, and I'm actually running on Debian 9, which was stretch. But where are all these images coming from? Um, and what are the different versions, the different tags that are available? So to understand that, let's have a look at Docker Hub, which, as I said before, is the is the default uh, registry used by Docker. So I, if I use hub dot hub dot docker dot com. This is the landing page for Docker Hub. If I go to, if I go on Explore to showcase the list of available images, we, we see that there are 8 million available images in Docker Hub, so a respectable number, I would say. And really, there is all kinds of stuff here. There are uh, databases, runtime environments, uh, JDK, base, operating systems, utilities, programming languages like Python, uh, web servers like Nginx. Um, so a, a really, really vast catalog of software. And if I look for operating systems, here it is Debian, which was the one I, I've been working with. And we can see that, we, indeed, we've told that we will get this image if we use Docker pull Debian. Uh, usually, on the uh, on the landing pages on Docker Hub for uh, for a given image, if if this page is well curated, it will also display a list of tags of, of available tags for the image. Uh, and if that's not enough, there is a, a dedicated tab where we can get all the details. Uh, on the various on the various tags. Um, special mention about the latest tag. Uh, the, uh, when we uh, when we do not enter a a tag in Docker. So, for example, when we when uh, before, as I was uh, as I was doing Docker pool Debian. When, when I do not enter a tag, Docker will default it to latest. So in reality, what I did before, when I did deep pull Debian, I was in reality pulling Debian latest. And we can confirm that because when I ran, uh, when I ran just Debian, I was running the version 11. And here on Docker Hub, we see that the latest tag indeed corresponds to 11. It is customary that 
the latest tag corresponds to the uh, most recent stable version of a given of a given software or a given image. Um, okay. Since we um, since we're talking about uh, since we're talking about image identifiers, uh, let's keep doing that and to see what exactly uh, are the options when retrieving uh, retrieving images. So I have shown you this syntax. Uh, let me clear the terminal. I've shown you this syntax with the image and the tag. When using this syntax, we are pulling those that are called official images from Docker Hub. What are those? So, if I go back to the general catalog of Docker Hub, you can see there, for example, there are official images, which are identified by their neat badge over here. So these official images are reference images for a given software and they are maintained directly by uh, the team at Docker Hub or appointed maintainers. So since they are official and reference images there is no need to namespace them uh, more specifically. But uh, what if I do not want to use an official image and I want to use a, an image from a specific user, an individual user in Docker Hub? Well, to do that, I have to prepend the username and separate it with a slash before the image tag. For example, let me log in to my, to my user in Docker Hub. Okay, so if I go to my, these are the repositories for the, these are the images that I have uh, on my, under my personal namespace. And I want to pull this Alpine image. So Alpine is a minimal Linux distribution, it's very essential. And I, and the Docker Hub tells me that I have to say my username slash Alpine. So let's try that. And latest. Just for the sake of expressing it uh, explicitly. Okay. I have I have pulled my image and then now I can run it. And this is indeed Alpine Linux 3.11. So this is the way that uh, we, um, we can retrieve arbitrary user images. Um, but Docker Hub, which have, we have been using uh, up until now, is not the uh, only one repository out there. So there are other ones. There are uh, Nvidia has a uh, as an image registry. Uh, registry, sorry. Nvidia has a registry. GitHub and GitLab have registries. Google has registries. So um, how can we access something that is not on uh, Docker Hub? Well, in this case, in this case, we just have to prepend once again the registry address before the username. So this is the full form of an image identifier that will let us retrieve and use an image practically anywhere on the available registries uh, on the internet. So for example, to show you, if I go to Quay.io, which is a registry um, create, maintained by Red Hat, and explore the images available there, if I wanted to pull this Prometheus node exporter image, um, I would have to, I don't know if you can read it, I would have to use docker pull, 
and then Quay.io, which is the name of the repository, the username Prometheus, and then the specific image. So, um, yeah, using exactly this general syntax. So now we have a fairly good idea of um, uh, a fairly good idea of how to use images that are already available, already out there. But we want to build our own images because uh, to package our and redistribute our own applications because that's where things start to really get interesting. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, I, I have prepared an example uh, where I have this little shell script which will print the contents of a directory called slash app. Uh, it will check whether a pack, the package wget is installed and it will print the value of an environment variable. And I want to package this script into an image and run it as a container. So Docker has the ability to create, to build new images, and in order to do so, we have to write a Docker file. Docker files are sequ uh, 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 Docker files are sequences of comments which incrementally build um, build an, uh, a new image. Um, they're not that different from shell scripts with the addition of specific keywords called instructions. Uh, every command in a Docker file must start with an instruction. The first instruction that, uh, that opens practically any Docker file is the from instruction. Use, the, the from instructions identifies an already existing image as a base image. So uh, any, um, anything that happens from the, uh, from, uh, on, in the rest of a Docker file will be added on top of what's already defined in this base image. So for example, opening with this from instruction, I will be building on the Debian, uh, on Debian latest, on the image that we have already did that we over have already used in the previous examples. So let's try to build an image based on this minimal Docker file. In order to build new images, we use docker build command, then we use the minus T option to already tag this image, to already associate an identifier. And it's already useful to uh, uh, label it direct, to identify directly with an identifier suitable for Docker Hub. So I will use my username and slash my script. The last argument that we need to provide to Docker build is the build context. So basically the location where the, the building process is happening and this usually is the current directory. So a dot is, is enough. I launched the, the building command and it completes very fast because basic, it basically just re-tags the Debian image. Uh, sorry. And it, I can see that if I run my newly created image, it is indeed based on Debian. Okay, now I have to get my little script into the image in order to run it. Let's get back into the Docker file and how can we do it? We can get files from the host system and into images using the copy instruction. Copy instruction takes two arguments. Excuse me. And the first one is the, the path of the, of the file on the host. And the second one is the destination path into the image. 
If a path doesn't exist into the image, there is no problem because Docker will create it for us. So let's build now. Let's rebuild my image. OK, I have copied the script. So now we should be able to run it, right? Let's try that. And then it's located in slash app and script.sh. Um, OK, not what uh, we were expecting. And we, we are getting a permission denied error. So let's see what let's see what is happening. So let's just print the contents of the app directory. You can see that the script is there, so that's fine. But aha, uh -huh, it has no execution permissions. So let so let's let's fix that. I am. But at this point, you, you maybe are realizing that the, this is an, a, writing a Docker file is it's an iterative process. It's a bit of trial and error. And that's perfectly normal. Um, and especially, uh, it happens a lot with very complex Docker files for complex, for, uh, for, uh, complex uh, software stacks. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, like you would build uh, or like you would build a, a native application. Uh, you try something, if it doesn't work, you find out what's wrong and you tweak the script. And that's exactly what we do when working with, uh, with Docker files. So in order to change the permission, the file permissions on the script, I'm gonna use the run instruction. The run instruction will execute um, any uh, command um, as if it was run in a shell. So I can basically run everything inside here uh, with the run command. And given this power, given this flexibility, run commands usually uh, constitute the bulk of Docker files. They are really the, where most of the things happen. So I'm going to use run with the, uh, and I'm going to run the chmod utility, setting 755 permissions, and then target my script. Uh, sorry, no, this is not the correct path. This is app. And then, and this is the, the path to the location of the script inside the container. Check. Okay, I just I just wanted to check. I am I am I'm still with you. <laughs> if I, I that I didn't drop again. Okay. So let's build again the image. This time with the permission change that is being applied. Now we should be able to run the script. And indeed it works. So I can see this is my script running into the Docker container. It's printing the contents of the app directory. There is no, but there is no wget package and the name environment variable is empty. So let's, uh, let's complete those things so that the script can run to, uh, to its full features, to the fullest, uh, to fulfill its purposes. Um, to install the wget package, I'm gonna use once again the run instruction. This time I will use the apt-get package manager and first I will run the update command. Why am I doing this? Well, due to the way Docker builds images one step at a time, one instruction at a time, that what happens is that the package manager cache gets reset every time that uh, Docker is building a new instruction. So there are some package managers like yum or DNF 
which are able to automatically re re refresh their caches. But, uh, oops, sorry, uh, let me close, the, let me close Slack. No disturbances right now. Um, but uh, apt-get, which is the package manager used by um, Debian and Ubuntu, uh, needs this, ref this update, this cache refresh done explicitly. So this is why uh, I am opening with this, this command with apt-get update. And after that, we can just do apt-get install, always say yes. Do not install any other software and install the wget package. Now, and build again. And you can see that this is the the output of apt-get of the package manager running inside uh, the uh, running during the image building process. Uh, the process is completed and it is tagged. So we launch again the script. This time, the script is able to detect the wget uh, package along with all its siblings, which have been installed by apt. Okay, last step, defining an environment variable. Um, Envi environment variables in images are defined with the env instruction, env. Uh, it just takes two arguments. The first one is the variable name and the other one is the variable value. So I want to define the name variable and I will just give it Alberto, which is my name. Save again, rebuild. Notice there's something happening here. The build completed very quickly, almost instantaneously. It did not run again the package manager. Why did that happen? Well, because every time that uh, Docker successfully builds uh, an, uh, a Docker file instruction, it successfully builds a step, it caches that the layer corresponding to that uh, to that command so it can use it again for building uh, successive uh, when rebuilding uh, successive step of the images or changing the image it doesn't have to rebuild everything uh, this cache uh, uh, the lookup to this cache is done by comparing the the liter the instructions on the Docker file, the lines of the Docker file. So, for example, if I had changed, if a, if a line matches, then Docker knows that it can reuse the cache for that given layer and not do and, and not reperform those actions. If I had changed something in my Docker file, so for example, if this line was, if this 755 was, for example, 775 then the cache lookup would fail, the cache would be invalidated, and the image would, uh, and the, all these commands would have to be rebuilt explicitly from the point where the cache lookup failed onwards. Um, special care, uh, you should take special care with the copy uh, instruction and with the add instruction, which is very similar, because the contents of the files that you are copying are checksummed and Docker will look at that checksum when uh, verifying the cache. What this means in practice is that even if the Docker file is absolutely identical but the content of this script file changed then the cache lookup would fail from this point and I will have to and Docker would rebuild explicitly everything from this point onwards. So, um, morale of the story, know that there is a build, uh, know of the existence of the Docker build cache, uh, know what are its rules, and use it to your advantage to uh, reduce the time it takes you to build the images.
Okay, after this brief digression in on the build cache, let's resume execution of our script. And we see once again app contents, wget package, and this time the name environment variable has the value that I have assigned to it in the Docker file. So great. Uh, I have my script all packaged and running as I would expect to um, in uh, into a container. So I want to share now this image I, I, uh, with somebody else. So in order to do that, I will upload this image on Docker Hub. And how do I do that? First thing I use the docker login command to enter my credentials, the credentials of my user in docker, or rather the, the credentials of the user I want to uh, upload this image to. And I use the same, the same credentials I used to log into docker hub. Okay, the login succeeded. And I can just do docker push and the image identifier. See that there are different layers being pushed. Just wait a little bit. Okay, the push is complete. So now if I go on my Docker Hub account, if I go on my Docker Hub account for my user, and I look for the my script, my script page, you can see that there is this image, and it was indeed last pushed a few seconds ago, 2.43 p.m. Central European time. And now, uh, basically, this image is available from, uh, I, co I could re re-download, uh, re-pull this image from any other computer and just run my script. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this was um, uh, a view on how we can complete those essential Docker Hub workflow that I have shown you during the presentation, the image, uh, the image build locally on a laptop and push to Docker Hub, and I could just then download from somewhere else. Um, I, would now like, uh, I would now like to show you some, uh, um, how, can we, how can we work with some H more HPC specific technologies in Docker images, because in the end, this is still an, an HPC themed summer school, right? So um, I will be talking about uh, MPI, how to get MPI into, an, uh, into a Docker image and how to use CUDA GPUs with images and, and Docker. So regarding MPI, I have prepared this, this example, which is called, uh, which is basically on a hello world uh, program in M in MPI it consists of only of this C source file. You see, I just initialize the MPI. I get the uh, total number of processes. I get the rank of this specific process, and then each MPI rank will just print an hello message. This file. Can, this program can be comp uh, compiled with the accompanying make file, which, uh, who, which uh, just uses the MPI CC um, compiler wrapper on, these, on the source file. So something very straightforward. And the image can be built with this Docker file. So I'm using once again Debian latest as the base image. I am using the package manager to retrieve the essential uh, compilation tools, GCC and, and uh, other, 
I'm getting the wget utility. And then I'm using wget to retrieve mpitch314, which is an MPI implementation. I, I just uh, untar and configure, make, make install on the on this MPI installation. Then I import the hello MPI source code and just and finally just call make. So uh, as you can see, there is nothing extravagant or exotic in the way we just uh, build MPI applications within Docker Images. It, it's like like many other like many other programs. You get the you get the dependencies in this case an MPI implementation. You get the code and compile with normal tools. Um, just a notice on the use of copy here. Uh, this is just for the sake of this example, but in the reality is very unusual to get application code inside uh, Docker files with a copy instruction. Usually you just retrieve it from Git repositories or use utilities like wget or curl to download the source code and then you just build uh, like this. So I have already built um, the image. I've already built the, the image of the Hello MPI program to save a, a little bit of time. And I can show you that it works with the Docker run. Uh, use it. and low MPI, and then I can just call the MPI run. I Let's run on four processes, and I remember that it is saved inside, the, the program, right, that the binary is located inside hello MPI uh, directory. And we get our response from four MPI ranks inside Docker. So this is the way you can validate uh, that an image works. In reality, when using uh, uh, when using container images on full HPC clusters, you, you will not have to invoke the MPI run program from inside the container because the dedicated HPC container HPC runtimes will be able to interact with the workload manager and uh, already in already uh, instant call the MPI launcher for you so this is just for the sake of this example running in sh inside docker and showcasing MPI functionality inside docker um, so the second HPC feature that I wanted to show is uh, how to use CUDA GPUs in uh, in images and in Docker. So I have a, I have a slide uh, for that. Uh, so when we use um, uh, when we want to use NVIDIA GPUs <clears throat> in Docker, we have to consider uh, two components. First one is the GPU accelerated application, uh, which uh, unsurprisingly, as we do with all, all other uh, applications, it, it has to be included in the image and built in the image along with uh, its uh, runtime dependencies. Uh, this includes also, of course, the, the CUDA toolkit and the CUDA runtime libraries. And this might, and installing the CUDA toolkit can uh, can cannot it can be uh, cumbersome, maybe not not very straightforward, especially if you're not used to it. So, uh, um, to increase the convenience of this process, to r remove this this hassle, NVIDIA provides base images for CUDA already including the toolkit, the compilers, and the runtime libraries, and they're available in this Docker Hub repository. 
What this means is that we can just uh, open a Docker file with this from uh, with uh, with the with the, um, the instruction from Nvidia slash CUDA, and then we already have the toolkit, and we can just proceed to build uh, our our application. The second component that we have to take care of is the GPU driver, and here things are uh, are can be a little bit more complex, because the driver it is tied to the hardware, and it cannot be part of a portable image because if we install the driver into an image that would mean that that specific image would only be able to run on systems which have compatible hardware with that driver version and this is not a, a good practice the image should be as portable as possible so the driver has to be injected into the container at the moment of its creation. And it is a responsibility of the container runtime to do that, like, like Docker. Uh, thankfully, NVIDIA is uh, helping out once again uh, by providing an open source software called the NVIDIA Container Toolkit, which, is ba which acts basically a plugin to Docker and, uh, and is able to um, import into the container the drivers, the driver stack, and the GPU devices and expose them to the container. The most recent versions of Docker already have native support for this feature uh, through this command line option, minus minus GPUs. And I, I will, so, NVIDIA Docker, the NVIDIA Container Toolkit has to be installed separately, but then Docker uh, has the support through the com directly through the command line. So I can show that to you very quickly. Um, so for example, if I have uh, if I use the if I use the minus minus GPUs options, and the argument is just to specify which GPUs on the system I should import into the container, I can use the uh, just any image, and I will call the NVIDIA SMI program, which is tied to the NVIDIA driver stack. So <clears throat> it is not part of Debian. Uh, of course, but it will be provided along with the NVIDIA driver by the by the NVIDIA plugin. And we can see that even if we have a very bare bone Debian image, I can still detect my my Quadro GPU on this laptop and all its technical details. So this is regarding the driver. Regarding the CUDA application and some CUDA code. As an example, I have prepared this Docker file that uses, uh, starts from the NVIDIA CUDA 10 uh, image. Then I just use the, uh, the package manager to install the CUDA samples, which is a, a suite of small programs to showcase uh, basic features of the CUDA programming model and uh, provide also some utilities for basic uh, checks, let's say, so, uh, checks to showcase the, the, healthy, the health of a CUDA installation. And I just uh, compile some of those samples using, using their make files. So, I already have uh, built this image and just to show you Uh, I can just show you Docker run GPUs all and I can just run for example a um, 
the samples. I, mean, I, I, I will use uh, a simulation sample representing an n-body simulation, so gravitation, a simulation of the gravitational interaction between a group of bodies. Use it in benchmark mode. Double precision. With 5,000 bodies. Oh, I have yeah. The typo is here. Sorry, the the directory is simulations, not simulation. And here is the program running, correctly detecting my quadro GPU once again. And it is running at 17 gigaflops, just to give you an idea of the of the performance that I am uh, that I can get from from this laptop. So, and and this is CUDA application code running inside the container. It's not related to the driver. Um, Okay, so um, I am very sorry of the technical issues in the middle of the session. I'm run. I'm I'm almost at the end of the time for my for the lecture. So uh, I will very briefly talk about um, talk about the the application of uh, about using containers in uh, HPC. So we have seen Docker. We have seen that we can do all. Uh, it is very popular. There is a lot of software already available. A lot of images already available. We can see that how we can use GPUs and uh, MPI. So we just use Docker on our compute clusters, and we live happily ever after, right? Um, unfortunately, that is not the case because there are several reasons why Docker and HPC are uh, not a good fit. Uh, first, the, the most uh, prominent of all is that the security model implemented by Docker assumes root privileges. So um, if, you, if you can use Docker on a system, you are basically root. You, have, uh, you can very easily uh, uh, perform actions as root, and of course, that is um, something that does not, does not sit well with HPC providers and the HPC centers. There are also other reasons, like uh, no integration with workload managers, limited support for accelerators and dedicated network hardware, and uh, no adequate uh, storage driver for parallel file systems. So. We cannot really use Docker on supercomputers and HPC clusters, but the HPC community did not give up, uh, luckily. Uh, and eventually, um, over the last uh, over the years, uh, a handful of HPC-focused container softwares emerged, and this software can, uh, uh, can allow us to run containers while respecting the, uh, the requirements of HPC environments, the requirements of the HPC providers, and also at the same time leveraging the unique characteristics of uh, HPC systems to extract the most uh, out of the, per, uh, uh, the utmost performance that we can get, because in the end, performance is in the name of, of the game. Um, so as you can see there there are there are a few of them and they they are uh, they are slightly different they have slightly different uh, uh, features so singularity for example it aims to provide a complete tool set of um, a complete suite of tools around uh, uh, a specific image uh, a specific format for the image which is based on a single file in the which they have created. Charlie Cloud is focused on uh, unprivileged execution and rootless technologies. And Sarus, uh, for example, aims to simplify uh, 
achieving uh, portability of performance through uh, a modular architecture based on plugins. Um, uh, so um, I, a few words more on Saros, which I wanted to showcase uh, a little bit prominently because it's the, so, it's the software that I have been working on for the last uh, for the last uh, few years. Uh, the Saros Saros is a container engine which combines the portability of containers with native HPC performance uh, and integrates with uh, to do so it integrates with infrastructure and customizes containers with plugin, but it still retains a lot of compatibility with Docker by being able to pull regular Docker images and providing a Docker command line interface. So what I want to say is that uh, don't think that since there are dedicated HPC solutions for containers, the knowledge and the expertise of using Docker is diminished. On the contrary, uh, because all these HPC container software are compatible with, with the Docker image format. So whatever is in a Docker image, you will be able to run on an HPC cluster through these HPC specific solutions. So as you can see, Docker knowledge is not diminished, but rather it is made even more important because you have the possibility of having a standard technology building a, a standard image format that gives you that gives you the flexibility of running on any one of these tools and uh, on on um, and on a larger number of system depending on of which other uh, like regardless of the, of the specific HPC runtime that you may find on on a given system so that, 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 that's the, the, the key message that, that I want to convey. There are HPC specific solutions, but Docker is still very relevant because it's a very flexible tool, a very versatile tool you can use on your laptops, on your personal systems to work on images and then deploy at scale those images using, uh, using one of the HPC solutions. Um, Okay, this brings me to the end of this presentation. Uh, the, as I said, the slides and the lab material are available in uh, GitHub. And uh, we have an introductory video for the lab, but you'll probably get to it uh, after the break. Uh, of an, uh, always an, an excellent references for discovering more about Docker is the is the official Docker documentation, and also I would like to highlight the best practices guide for writing Docker files with lots and lots of very useful advice. And this is my contact email if you want to reach to me directly uh, after the summer school. Uh, so we uh, uh, summer school has been. Um, has been supported and funded uh, by the European Union. So we're very grateful for that, worth a mention. And I thank you very, very much for your attention during this lecture. And once again, apologies for the, for the technical problems faced uh, in uh, midway through.